Uh, second thing is about clicker questions. Um, I posted clicker scores if you have a zero and you're pretty sure that you have been here and you've been clicking, you've been getting the right answers. Um, it's distinctly possible that somehow the clicker registration has gotten off. I have 26 people who've been clicking and I don't have names connected to their clickers. So if I have that, email me your clicker number with your name, of course, and then I can connect the two of them together. I know there's one person that has a problem with that, but um, we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, if you are really wondering about your clickers, we can actually do a quick clicker test here right at the end of class today. I also have all your Scantrons. You can get them back at the end of class today. Any questions about clickers at this point? Good, okay, um, about the exam. Um, lots of people have been asking, you know, what, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? How is it going to be normalized, etc.? I only normalize at the end of term. I look at all the exams together and then I do the normalization. But you want to know where you stand right now, don't you? So what I do is I say, okay, I take the top score and usually use that as the cutoff, except if we have cases where the top score is ridiculous which in this case it is, it's 48. Um, because the next highest score is 42, and I think the next highest score after that is something like 39. So clearly that's not an appropriate place to really be normalizing. One of you is a ringer and actually I know who it is. But um, that's, so I would say at this point in terms of the minimum grade that you would have, I would normalize to 42 and that'll give you a percentage. Now assuming that this ringer does really well for the rest of the course, then we just sort of ignore that one which I'm guessing that this person probably will, but who knows. Um, and then you can just basically back calculate where you stand. But again, this is a minimum. It probably will be higher than this when I finally do my normalization at the end of the term. So any questions about sort of numbers whatsoever? If there's a problem with your Scantron, I have scans of all of them, so let me know. Yeah. Okay, there, let's worry about clickers other than people who have zero later. Now, I just normalized, that was actually the highest score that we had. So that's why the 14 is there. But that may or not have been things that may have counted like, oh, am I actually a junior, senior, et cetera. So I just wanted to make sure that those were there and give you a bit of an idea. Okay, uh, one of the other things I do, and those of you who've downloaded the notes will actually take a look at this, I go back and look at the statistics on the exams to see what questions were really bad questions, other than the one with the base pair, which had two possible answers, um, and the ones that lots of people missed, and I thought were important in terms of the understanding for later on. No, the stuff in the first midterm is not going to be specifically tested on in the next two exams, but I assume that you know that information. And if you're answering questions on this exam incorrectly, then for the later ones, it might be confusing. So this one is the addition of ubiquitin to a protein is most similar in mechanism to GTP hydrolysis by a G protein, GTP exchange for GDP in a G protein, kinase activity, phosphatase activity, or proofreading by DNA polymerase. So the important thing here is that ubiquitin modification is what? It's a covalent modification. Is GTPase activity by a G protein a covalent modification? No. Is proofreading activity a covalent modification? No. So <clears throat> it's all about that covalent modification. Everything else here is, if anything, breaking a covalent bond as far as that's concerned. So um, that's really the main point here, at least as far as the question is concerned. This is a covalent modification that takes place. Next question a lot of people had trouble with, actually I think only about 10 or 15% of you got this right. Um, and I can blame Eric on this because you know, he was the one who gave this lecture. Um, mm -hmm. Two ligands A and B bind to two different conformations of the enzyme X. So ligand A is the enzyme substrate, whereas ligand B binds to remote allosteric site. Thus binding of A to X does not affect the affinity of X to B. B to X does not affect the rate of the reaction. A to X increases the affinity of X for B. B to X decreases the affinity of X for A. B to X is a large effect on the binding of 
a to x, but binding of a to x is small effect on a to b binding. So there are a couple of things here that you can immediately get rid of. Which are those? So, does not affect the affinity of x of binding for b. Okay? Presumably because of some kind of allosteric um, thing which is going on there. What about rate of the reaction? So it might or it might not. You don't actually really know, but uh, A to X increases the affinity of X for B. B to X decreases the affinity of X for A. The important thing here is really two different conformations that they're binding to. So one's binding in one conformation, the other's binding in another conformation. And so that basically gets to here and at the bottom. So this is what we're looking at here. So get the pointer over on. So We've got binding of, in this case, it's blue and orange, but you know, A and B is the same way. So you're binding to one state or you're binding to another state, two different conformations of your enzyme. And if you're binding to two different conformations, binding of one is then going to be stopping the, the binding of the other. So that's, you know, B to X decreases the affinity of X for A, and vice versa. Does that make sense? Allosteria is really kind of a confusing thing. Yeah? Yeah, because, well, you're binding to two different states. And so if you're binding to the same, then you're going to be increasing the affinity because you're going to be helping both of them bind at the same time. But clearly, since they're binding to different states, different conformations. So that's why it's not stimulating both of them binding together. Because if one's stimulating the other, that means that both of them are going to be binding together. Yeah. That was it? OK. OK, the last one that, this was my lecture, so not, I can't blame Eric on this one. Um, the acetylation of lysines on histone tails loosens the chromatin because it adds positive charges to the histone. Recruits the heterochromatin protein HP1, resulting in establishing heterochromatin. Can be performed on methylated lysines <clears throat> only if they're first demethylated. It's sufficient for the formation of open chromatin structures and covalent modifications, thus they're reversible. Uh, even if we didn't really talk about C very much, all of these other ones are incorrect. Um, clearly, it's not adding a positive charge, it's taking away a positive charge. Recruiting the heterochromatin protein, if anything, acetylation is leading to opening, so you're not forming heterochromatin. Covalent modifications, thus irreversible. We just talked about covalent modifications. You know, kinases are a really nice example of that. Comes on, comes off. I think really comes down between C and D here. Is sufficient for the formation of open chromatin structure or can be performed on methylated lysines only after they've been first demethylated. So it's, it's not sufficient, just the acetylation is not enough. You have to have other things going on. You have to have binding and then further methylation, further changes which are happening to your chromatin. And maybe I didn't do a good enough job of explaining that. But just that particular modification is not sufficient. And that's partly why understanding the histone code is really problematic because there's lots of extra things which are happening there. So I would say is necessary but not sufficient in most cases, but again, there are always exceptions to these. So that's the, the histone code here. Another way of looking at this, and again, it's the same slide, here at position nine, we've got methylation or acetylation. Not methylation and acetylation at the same time, which may be confusing if you look up here. That's this or that. Again here, this or that. Yeah. Right, so at a particular lysine residue. Okay. So it can be performed on methylated lysines. So if you have a methylated lysine to start with, you've got to take those methyl groups off before you put an acetyl group on. But K4 is a methylated lysine. K4 is methylated, yes, but it's, you could get acetylation here, but only in the absence of methylation there. So here, if you're going from, for instance, this case, where you have trimethylated K9, histone H3, and you want to go to trimethylated K4 and acetylated K9, you have to get rid of the methyl groups on here. So that's what that question is about. 
And again, I don't think I did a particularly good job of explaining it, which gives me yet another chance to go over and talk about it. Okay, more questions on the exam, specific questions, specific answers, feel free to email me. Um, I'll answer those and I'll probably end up posting them on D2L as well. Okay, base pair, again, I wanted to have the wrong position of the riboses, but it turns out I put in a U, A base pair, and reverse Watson-Crick base pair instead of a U, T reverse uh, Watson-Crick base pair there. So that's why there were two possible answers to that. Sorry about the confusion. So <clears throat> continue talking briefly about origins, sort of the beginning of replication, and to some extent the end of replication today, and then we'll move along and talk about DNA repair and I have this uh, model which is kind of falling apart, so it's a nice example of you know, what we need to do for DNA repair. So, but first, um, origins, and how origins were discovered originally. Um, origins in E. coli were pretty straightforward. Um, you found there was just one, and so it was pretty easy to find. That's where DNA A bound. You went from there, you had two replication forks, et cetera. So that was pretty easy to deal with. On the other hand, eukaryotes had many of these replication origins. So how did you find them? And the way that this was done is a really nice genetic experiment. Um, these are what are called the autonomous replication sequences. That's what R stands for, um, with an E is a rather nasty word in German. It's a different story. Uh, so basically, what these researchers did is they took random pieces, and hopefully all of the pieces, of the Saccharomyces cerevisiae genome, and put them into these little pieces of DNA that couldn't replicate normally. So if you take this piece of DNA, you put it into yeast, it doesn't replicate. And so you don't have any of this particular gene. It's a histidine gene. It's just a selectable gene. So if you have a random piece of DNA that doesn't have a replication origin, you're not going to be making this histidine gene, and you're not going to get very many colonies that grow. Now, each of these colonies is representing one organism which has now picked up one of these particular pieces of DNA. Doesn't have a replication origin, then you're not going to get this histidine gene being expressed and then be able to grow in the absence of histidine. On the other hand, if you happen to have picked up a piece of DNA that has one of these origins of replication on it, or autonomous replication sequence, then you'll get lots and lots of yeast that are growing here because They've all picked up this right particular piece of DNA. They can go back and sequence this piece of DNA and take a look at it, see what's actually there. That's what people did, and they found that these origins of replication, about one every 30,000 base pairs or so in the yeast genome, which is about 10 million base pairs, uh, and again, this you know, could in theory replicate in eight minutes. It takes 40 minutes for the replication cycle, so that tells you've got multiple origins that are being used. They have origin recognition complex binding sites, again, just like we've talked about in terms of initiator binding, initiator binding, and then areas of AT-rich sequence, which are then relatively easy to get to come apart. Then you've got helicase loaders, et cetera. So you get that <clears throat> whole process which is going on. If you look at one of the yeast chromosomes, this is yeast chromosome three down here at the bottom, all of these green spots are where the origins of replication are. Now, you have a big problem, however, if you've got multiple origins of replication. If you have an origin of replication, it starts, you get two replication forks that go off and you know, head off towards the next replication fork which is great, but you want to, again, just like in the case of E. coli, just start once and only once. So how do you do that in yeast, and it turns out, in pretty much all eukaryotic origins? The way that works is it's all about the orc um, and the origin recognition complex, which stays associated with the origin even after you have replication taking place. But there's a change that happens to that origin recognition complex. And that change is phosphorylation. So if you have phosphorylation of your ORC complex that says, hey, this origin has already been used. Don't start here again. 
until you've gone all the way through the cell cycle, you've already replicated your DNA, it's separated to its nice daughter cells, et cetera. So that's that phosphorylation takes place. Once you're phosphorylated, this is, okay, we're done. Don't start here again. When you've gone through the cell cycle, however, and you've actually had cell division starting out, you need to go through another synthesis phase of the cell cycle, the first thing you do is have a, what they call a sweep of phosphatase activity, which will take off that phosphorylation. Once you have this phosphorylation, which has been taken off, now you have a active origin of replication, are also called a licensed origin of replication. That ORC now binds to two proteins, CDT1 and CDC6. Um, CDC stands for what? Cell division cycle. It's all these darn geneticists. They found mutants that had problems with the cell cycle, and they just named them. You know, cyclin, <clears throat> and so cyclins, CDCs, et cetera, they're all defects in the cell cycle. So if you don't have CDC6, you have a problem in your cell cycle. The reason you have a problem in your cell cycle is because you don't start replication. CDC6 together with CDT1 bind to the ORC complex, they get the helicase. And again, this is the replicative helicase in eukaryotic cells, this is MCM. MCM, once it gets onto the DNA, pulls the two strands apart, just like any coli and all other systems, as soon as you've got those two strands apart, then replication takes place. You get primases, you get replication fork formation, et cetera. So it's always that the critical step is getting this MCM associated with this. MCM, by the way, is another one of these names brought up with, by the geneticists it's called mini chromosome maintenance. Mini chromosomes are basically those plasmids that I talked about in the previous slide. Those are the extra pieces of DNA that you've put an autonomous replication sequence on. If you've got MCM, then those replicate perfectly normally. If you have problems with MCM, then those don't replicate normally. Turns out you also don't have problems replicating the rest of the chromosome as well. But that's how those were originally found. So you have MCM, CDC6, and CDT1. Then you get degradation of CDC6 through phosphorylation, which is a signal for getting degraded. You know, we talked about signals for getting degraded with ubiquitin. Phosphorylation can also be a good signal for degradation. And as you'll talk about a lot in cell biology, or those of you who are taking cell biology right now, um, the cell cycle is really all about phosphorylation, kinases, phosphatases, et cetera. So this is leading through the cell cycle, that phosphorylation here, and it turns out phosphorylation is phosphorylating CDC6, which leads to degradation, but it's that same set of cyclin-dependent kinases which also phosphorylate ORC and say, hey, we've already replicated here. So that's how you get single origin use, also called licensing, taking place in eukaryotic replication. Questions on that aspect of things? Talked a lot about histones. Oh, sure, sorry. Yeah. That one. Yeah, so CDC6 is this sort of. I don't know, axe blade shaped thing here. And then, so it associates here with non-phosphorylated orc. You get MCM, which is bound, then the cyclin-dependent kinases come in. This gets phosphorylated and degraded. This guy gets phosphorylated and says, hey, we're done. Yeah, no, those do not hang on. So the, the question is, again, to, to get this on tape, uh, is 
are they really a transient interaction, just there briefly saying, okay, time to go, and then move on. It's really the main thing, it's, you're exactly right. And the main thing there is just to get the cyclin-dependent kinases to the right place to say, okay, now we're ready to go through the cell cycle, we activate these CDKs, and then we move through the process. But yes, they're very transient. Yes? Um, okay, so the question is, is CDK phosphorylating ORC and CDC6 at the same time? Um, the answer is yes and no. Um, there are multiple cyclin-dependent kinases, and so that's why it's not actually really the same, but they're doing it at the same time in the cell cycle. It's basically just, you know, going right at the beginning of S phase. Because remember, S phase is the synthesis phase. That's where you get replication taking place. Okay, so our friends, the histones with modified histones or those that have lysine modifications, either methylations or, <coughs> excuse me, acetylations, what happens when you have replication? So here, on the right-hand side, here's our replication fork. Again, completely oversimplified. Uh, replication fork moving along through histone-bound templates, and here, H3 and H4 are green and blue again, as we've had them always before. H2A and H2B are yellow and red. When you have replication, H3, H4 stay together, usually associated with the DNA, and you have exchange of your H2As and H2Bs, and because you have modifications, usually again on histone H3 or some alternative histone, which is there, that leads to either modification or incorporation of one of those alternative histones or the modified histones right next to them. And so that's why you maintain either, for instance, a centromere with alternative histones or heterochromatin versus euchromatin as you undergo replication. Um, there are a couple of histone chaperones here, CAF1 and MAP1. I don't expect you to remember those names, but they are really kind of what we we're talking about also when we talked about histone remodeling, sorry, chromatin remodeling complexes. There are these histone chaperones that help exchange these things in and out of nucleosomes. This brings us to the end, not the end of lecture, but the end of the chromosome, and the problem that you have when you have semi-discontinuous replication. Because you've got Okazaki fragments, well actually for that matter, all DNA replication starts with what? Starts with a primer. What's the primer made out of? RNA. Do you want to have RNA incorporated in your genome? No, although it turns out I was just reading literature the other day, there are quite a few riboses in our genomes, probably left over from some of these things. Really interesting, curious, nobody knows why. But for the most part, RNA is bad. Why is RNA bad in terms of being the primer? Low fidelity, exactly. Um, these are going to be making mistakes. So you don't want to have lots of mistakes. The problem, of course, is, is that when you get out to the end of your genome, now you've got this RNA, which was the primer for that last Okazaki fragment at the end, which gets degraded by usually what protein? RNase H, exactly. So RNase H is going to be degrading this. And now you have this one strand out of your four, which is shorter than all the other ones. If you now replicate this, that's going to get shorter. And each time you undergo replication, it's going to get shorter and shorter and shorter. So this is a problem because each time you undergo replication, your genome is going to get, or actually each of the urinary chromosomes is going to get shorter and shorter and shorter. And it turns out this actually is what happens in aging. Um, and in some cases, there was a number of companies a few years ago, it was like, we're going to fix the ends of your telomeres and it's going to solve aging. Well, it's actually not quite true. There's lots of other problems too. But um, that was the idea is how do you deal with this end problem? And how can you have these linear chromosomes and not every replication cycle have to be reduced? Well, the answer is, what's always the answer in this class if I'm teaching it? But what kind of enzyme? Where does it come from? Like, exactly, viruses. <laughs> so people argue about whether this is viruses, viral derived at all. But 
Um, the key here is the enzyme telomerase, which takes those ends and extends them. And all it does is add to the ends of chromosomes. It's a reverse transcriptase, which is why there's a viral connection to it as well. Um, there's also a big RNA component to the telomerase. So the blue part here is RNA that's together with the green part, which is protein. This RNA serves really two purposes. One is sort of seems to be structural, but much more importantly, what this RNA does, which is part of the telomerase complex, is it provides a template that the reverse transcriptase can now use to make more DNA. So here is the three prime end of your chromosome. Here's the telomerase RNA. Now this provides a template, it's an RNA template now, that can be extended off of the three prime end. So you extend off the three prime end. Extending off the three prime end. This is great, it's wonderful, it extends, but if you think about it, the three prime end is not the problem. You got rid of the primer over here with the five prime end. So all that the telomerase is doing is adding on the three prime end. It just adds more template. So it's not fixing where that primer was. It's just adding more template that now your normal DNA polymerase machinery can extend and fill in. And what happens is this telomerase just makes multiple copies of a sequence which is now complementary to the template sequence in the telomerase molecule, which was one of the questions in one of the old exams that people were confused about. It's an RNA sequence that then is templating extension of these three prime ends. Once you've done that, now you have normal primase, so it's going to make RNA, and then DNA polymerase is going to extend that. This piece is going to get chewed up again by RNase-H. So you're always going to have this little piece at the end here, always going to have a little bit of a three prime end projection. But now, since you've got a bunch of repeated sequences which are there, this is complementary to the repeated sequences that you had back there. So what happens is this DNA actually loops around and loops around and then base pairs back here with that single stranded piece and you end up with what's called a, a T-loop structure, which is binding these guys together. Now, this T-loop structure is supposed to be protecting the ends of your DNA from all the nasty exonucleases that are out there that love to chew in at ends. Um, but also there's a whole complex of other proteins which are there and if you're interested in what those look like um, you can take a look at this review but we've got enough proteins to remember so we won't go into all of those details. But it's a really nice example of all the other things that are going on in the, the telomeres. But it's mostly, as far as we're concerned, it's the telomerase. It's adding these extra copies at the ends of genomes. One of the targets, so I mentioned aging was an issue, certainly with telomerase and losing ends. You lose telomerase activity in senescing cells. But lots of cancer cells have turned on telomerase. And so some of the chemotherapy drugs actually try and block telomerase activity because that telomerase activity is really active. What happens in a cancer cell? It's replicating like crazy. Well, if the ends were getting chewed in all the time on all of your chromosomes, that would be a problem. So they, in fact, end up activating telomerase. And so if you can now turn off that telomerase activity, that might be a way to address this uncontrolled proliferation that you have in cancer cells. So a number of people are looking into that in terms of, of chemotherapy um, aspects of things. So review for replication, you know, hopefully it's all the stuff we've gone through. Today, we just really finished up this last part today, um, looking at how initiators look in eukaryotes, how they're regulated. Again, this is all cell cycle related, and telomeres. More questions on replication or telomeres before we um, move on and talk about how crummy DNA is as genetic material. Uh, so, DNA <coughs> is incredibly susceptible to chemical modification. 
And since all of the information in DNA has to do with the chemistry, because it's all about the hydrogen bonds that are present in the middle of the structure, if you have chemical modifications, you're changing that genetic material. So it's a real problem. And how do you deal with that? Well, uh, first, what are the problems? Uh, clearly, if you have a chemical change, that can lead to a genetic change. If that's in a germline or it's a cell which is replicating, that can be passed along. But any one of these chemical changes is not just going to be changing the information content, which is here. It can also be messing up all the processes which are otherwise happening. And so, obviously, the ones we've talked about are replication. If you have a problem with replication, again, as you're pulling apart the two strands, if you have a problem pulling apart the two strands, you have a problem with the DNA polymerase, putting in a new nucleotide, that's clearly going to be a problem. If you think about transcription, it's exactly the same thing. Strands are being pulled apart. Cancer seems to be mostly caused, and again, people will argue about this. Good cancer biology course next term. Dr. Singer's going to be teaching it. I'm talking a lot about these things, but certainly lots of mutations are involved in cancers and may in fact be critical for the development of cancers in the first place. Mutations certainly accumulate on aging, uh, but so clearly problems with DNA. Also mentioned before, it's really inefficient because you need <clears throat> three bases to get all your information. You've got two copies of everything. So the efficiency of DNA is bad, so we have to have compaction, all of these chromatin things. But the saving grace probably of DNA is you have this redundant information. You've got the two strands. You've got the information on this strand, which tells you what the information is on the other strand. And that's true for making sure that you can keep that DNA and not have multiple mutations that are getting passed along from generation to generation. So that allows all or most, I should say, of DNA repair, at least any kind of modifications that happen to one strand. As soon as you talk about modifications to both strands, then you've got problems because then you, you can't have that redundancy anymore. On the other hand, if we didn't have mutations, we would probably all still be slime or life as itself might not have even existed. So um, having a genetic material which can be modified and be passed on from generation to generation and not so much from generation to generation but organism to organism, that now um, allows us to have the amazing diversity of life which we have on the planet right now. How do you balance this? And this is actually it's a real problem. You know, okay, how do you balance having lots of chemical changes and still have, having enough genetic modification or genetic variability to allow evolution? And so this is actually a real interesting question. And it turns out that we've got a pretty darn big genome that has to be replicated all the time. So lots of changes happen. We'll talk about exactly those changes and how frequently they happen um, very soon. But it turns out because we're warm-blooded and live in an aqueous environment with UV irradiation, we've got all kinds of problems with our DNA. And we know a lot about some of the problems with DNA based on, in fact, some human diseases. Um, turns out, we, I sort of vaguely mentioned this really briefly in passing, um, colon cancer, some of the hereditary colon cancers are due to m defects in mismatch repair. So you remember that's the fidelity of replication. So a lot of hereditary, um, so hereditary non-polyopsis colon cancers are due to mutations in these genes. If you have mutations, probably a lot of you have heard about um, BRCA, uh, very often mutated in breast cancer. It is involved normally in homologous recombination, fixing double-stranded breaks. Uh, we've also got xeroderma pigmatosum. This is a particular disease where people have mutations in proteins that are important for repairing a particular kind of DNA damage, mostly DNA damage due to UV irradiation. So these people have very high rates of skin cancer, um, colon sensitivity, etc. So lots and lots of different human diseases which are directly related to DNA repair and fixing some of the problems. Well, what are those problems? Um, ionizing radiation, hopefully not too many of us are exposed to too much ionizing radiation most of the time, uh, but it causes backbone cleavage. And so what that does, and in fact, that's one of the problems with this model, 
Um, we've got lots of backbone cleavage going on here. Uh, backbone cleavage is just between the phosphates and the ribose. So the backbone, so we're talking about um, the phosphodiester backbone, where you look at that. Um, ionizing radiation is, however, also used in cancer therapy. Anyone heard about radiation medicine? It's all about ionizing radiation and breaking the DNA. So that's the point. That's what that radiation is doing, is it's, it's breaking the backbone. So uh, lots of chemical base modification. So that's what's on the inside now of the DNA. Um, particularly frequent is deamination of cytosines. We'll look at that in just a second in terms of the chemical changes there. Hundreds per day per cell are happening. That's way more than you want to have. So you need to repair a lot of these things. Decurination is really probably the most common chemical change that happens to DNA. Turns out that if there's one case in here, at least I had a case of decurination already, it's where the ribose and the base get separated from each other. And it's particularly true for purines. Purines are, again, the big nucleotides. These are your guanines and your adenines. So depurination happens tens of thousands um, at 37 degrees, so hopefully most of our body temperatures um, on any given day. So huge amounts of depurination are happening. You lose a base on one strand, that's clearly a problem. So you have to deal with that. Um, UV light, okay, fortunately in Portland, you don't have to deal with this too much. It's that big yellow thing in the sky we don't see too often, but uh, that causes particularly pyrimidine dimers. We'll look at that, but it's whenever you have the small ones. So remember, cytosine and thymine, these are the small ones. As soon as you have UV irradiation, these will then cross-link to each other um, between the two ring structures, and it causes a big change in the structure of your DNA when that happens. We'll take a look at that as well. So basically, everything that we like, heat, light, oxygen, all bad for DNA. What happens when you have these chemical modifications, particularly the bases, or they don't get repaired properly, uh, two different kinds of mutations you can have. Um, either the easy ones, here I call transitions, transversions. <coughs> Lots of people talk about these in genetics as well. Basically, transition is when you have something which is the same size going to the same size. So here, just the abbreviation, again, the lazy molecular biologists have Ys for pyrimidines, because there's a Y in the pyrimidine. So that would be a C going to a T or a T going to a C in terms of those changes. Um, or you have a pure R, purine, G going to A, A going to G. Um, these are actually relatively easy changes to make because they're not changing the structure of the DNA that much. Because you think about it, small, you know, small goes to small or large goes to large. And so you're not going to have as many of the changes that are happening there. On the other hand, you also have transversions, and that would be from small to big or big to small. And these are usually corrected by mismatch repair, but a few cases they will actually get replicated before repair happens, and then you clearly have a mutation which is going to get <clears throat> continued. How do you get these changes? Uh, mostly, and I would say the vast majority of these are due to our friend water. So we live in an aqueous solution, at least all of our DNA is in an aqueous solution. Hydrolysis, hydrolysis happens. Um, and particularly true with these arrows here. So the size of the arrows here represents how frequently any of these things are happening, and the color represents what process is happening. So hydrolysis. Hydrolysis right here of the glycosidic bond between the ribose and the base, that leads to depurination. Very common in Gs and in As. You also have depyrimidination. Happens in Cs and Ts, but you see the arrow is a little bit smaller. Doesn't happen quite as much. Also have methylation, which happens on the DNA. And that methylation, most frequently, again, where's the biggest green arrow? It's right here on this nitrogen in G and a little less so on this nitrogen over here on A. Oxidative damage, again, we're all in 
an oxygen-rich <clears throat> world. Oxygen is wonderful for metabolism. It's also the reason it's wonderful for metabolism is because it's so reactive and also will react with DNA. The particular cases where you have lots of oxidation that happen is at this position, the eight position of guanine, and then also here in these double bonds in adenine. Last one that I wanted to talk about here is another hydrolysis reaction. This is that probably second most frequent kinds of DNA damage that are happening. This is deamination. And all deamination is, is again, it's hydrolysis of this amine group, which is here. You also have deamination that happens on guanines and adenines. Both of them have amine groups. Both of those can be hydrolyzed, but with nowhere near the same kind of frequency as you have deamination of cytosine. So let's look at some of those again in a little bit more detail. Here is <clears throat> deamination of cytosine. Here's your cytosine residue, our little water molecule comes in, performs hydrolysis, you lose your amine group, and what you end up with is uracil. So deamination of cytosine leads to uracil, which is probably one of the reasons that DNA doesn't have uracil in it, uh, is because of this deamination process, and we'll take a quick look at that in a little bit more detail. The other really common one, again, is this hydrolysis that happens in the glycosidic bond where you have addition of water will cause the removal of this bond. Now you've got your phosphodiester backbone just with an OH that's attached to it. Mentioned pyrimidine dimer formation. This can happen between T's. It can happen between C's. It can happen between C and T. But what happens is the ring structures of these pyrimidines uh, end up usually offset from each other. It's a normal Watson Crick DNA, they're offset from each other. But the DNA wobbles around a little bit. Shine UV light on these, then they cross-link from each other, and then what they do is they'll line up those two bases right on top of each other. So this is kind of one of the reasons I brought the model as well, is that if you line these two up with each other, you're going to be swishing the DNA to You're really going to be changing the structure a whole lot more than that. And so that's one of the ways you can actually detect what's going on there. There's a red circle down here. Some of you are wondering, why did he put a red circle at the bottom? And that's because, <clears throat> particularly later on in the course, what we'll talk about is one of the modifications that happens to DNA. Turns out this is a modification that happens in silencing of DNA. So it's part of the heterochromatin process, is you methylate your cytosine. And the methylation of cytosine happens right here. The big problem with this is when you have a methylated cytosine, if you have deamination of this methylated cytosine, instead of what happens up here, deamination of cytosine needs to uracil, when you have deamination of cytosine, that gives you thymidine. But thymidine is what you normally have in DNA. And so this particular transition, this DNA damage event is really hard to detect because, you know, this looks like a completely normal nucleotide, and it is a perfectly normal thymidine nucleotide. So, <clears throat> so risk, sorry, let's run back. Yeah, you have to go first this time. Oh, so this 5-methylcytosine. Um, so 5-methylcytosine, we'll talk more about 5-methylcytosine a little bit later on, but it turns out in silenced DNA, you very often have methylated cytosines, and it happens at the 5 position. As soon as you have a deamination event, which happens because we're in an aqueous solution, a deamination of 5-methylcytosine that gives you thymidine. And thymidine looks like a totally normal base. So how does the DNA repair machinery know that this transition has taken place? Yeah, do you have a question still? I was just confirming that A, B, and C are all considered deamination, or particularly with methylated Okay, no, so the question is, um, are A, B, and C all deaminations? No, A and C are deaminations, but the middle one is a depurination, because you're living, using the whole purine. The whole purine is coming off there. But, but these are then, the, the, the upper two here are the most common, which are happening. Particularly depurination is the most common. But then close second is this deamination, which is taking place. So that's those two, again, that we're looking at here. Again, you've got depurination of guanine and 
<coughs> deamination of cytosine. What do you end up with? You have a ribose that has nothing attached to it, or you have a ribose that has uracil that's attached to it. Or again, this um, thymidine dimer um, stacked on top of each other, and again, clearly messing up with the structure of your DNA. Most normal organisms, i.e. not including us, um, have this wonderful protein called DNA photolyase. And what that does is it actually uses basically the thing that hurt you in the first place to reverse it. So if you have a pyrimidine dimer which is formed due to UV irradiation, those organisms that have DNA photolyase, they bind to this very specific structure that forms because of the kink in the DNA, because you've basically twisted things to get the two to stack on top of each other. That recognizes that in the presence of light, it just reverses that reaction. Again, unfortunately, we don't have this particular um, way of dealing with thymidine dimers. We have to use a much less efficient technique, which is what's shown here in B. It's also called nucleotide excision repair. Um, that's for comparison, base excision repair. We'll start out here with nucleotide excision repair because that's how we repair pyrimidine dimers because we don't have a photolyase. These pyrimidine dimers cause a change in the structure of DNA. So you've got a change in the structure. If you've got a change in the structure, then there's not a specific base which is changed, but it's a change in the structure and then the repair machinery recognizes there's a problem with the structure of the DNA. Then what it does, actually very similar to mismatch repair, is there are two NICs that take place. These are now endonucleases that cut in the middle of your DNA. There's a nice endonuclease activity which happened just here. Uh, so it cuts in the middle on either side of where that problem is. Now that gets removed through a repair DNA helicase, and it turns out some of those mutations and high prevalence of cancer and disease are these DNA helicases that are important for DNA repair. And now you have a 3 prime OH, a nice little template, so your DNA polymerase can come in, fix this, and repair it. These end up usually being on the order of about 20 nucleotides, between 10 and 20 nucleotides that get cut out here. This is clearly a pretty inefficient process because you have one change and now you've got to fill in up to you know, 20 nucleotides. So um, there's a lot of nucleotide triphosphates that are being used in this process. On the other hand, a much more efficient process is this one over here called base excision repair. Now this is very specific to one particular change. This particular one, we're looking at cytosine deamination. Cytosine deamination is recognized because, hey, we've got a U here. We shouldn't have a U in our DNA. We should have, <clears throat> usually it's going to be a cytosine. So we have a very specific glycosylase here, which recognizes that wrong thing. In this case, it's uracil. Glycosylase, again, it's an ACE, so it's an enzyme. What does it do? It breaks the glycosidic bond. And again, the glycosidic bond is between the sugar and the base. So it breaks that bond. Once that bond is broken, now we've got a, a pyrimidinic or a purinic site here. It's an AP site, i.e. it's missing the base. See here? Something missing a base. This is actually really nice because if you remember the most common event that takes place in terms of DNA damage is just hydrolysis of that glycosidic bond just by water. Forget the glycosylates. And so now this position right here has covered the two most common kinds of changes that you get. So once you've got this AP site, now you just need to repair this one little place. Yeah. So the question is, is this happening during replication or after proofreading? Uh, the answer is this is happening all the time because you always are, have heat, you always have water, so you're always going to be getting this taking place. So in your just standard double-stranded DNA, so all throughout the cell cycle. So this is going to be happening. 
Um, and we'll talk about how pretty amazing that is, that you're screening six billion base pairs of DNA all the time to see if this stuff is going on. Pretty mind-blowing. <laughs> and when they're compacted in chromatin as well. So it's, it's really pretty amazing. So um, getting back to here. So now we've got an AP site. If it was a glycosylase that took it out, times the uracil DNA glycosylase is an apyrimidinic site because that's the pyrimidines, the small ones, um, or a purinic site because you just had hydrolysis with depurination that took place. Now there's a specific endonuclease. Again, this cuts in your DNA, which will make a cut at one end. Then there's a phosphodiesterase. Remember the backbone are phosphodiesters. So first you make a cut. That's your endonuclease. Then the phosphodiesterase chews up that phosphate, which is still there. Because the phosphate is still there because it's that AP site. You just lost the base off of it. Now you've got a template, a 3'OH, DNA polymerase, comes in, puts in a base. Now your <laughs> DNA ligase seals it up. You're done. This is great, but it only works if you have a very specific way of detecting these problems. And that very specific way is one specific protein that does that. So here, you've got really common changes. Again, deamination of cytosine, depurination. Not surprisingly, you have specific ways for dealing with that. You have a lot of non-specific things, big changes in your DNA that cause structural problems then you use the more sort of general way of saying, okay, this piece is bad. I don't know what's bad with it, but I'm getting rid of it. And it's a bigger piece than you use. So very specific, if you know what the problem is, again, totally over-anthropomorphizing here, uh, you use this base excision repair. If you don't know what it is, you just know it's bad, you use nucleotide excision repair. But how do you know that there's a problem? And this is getting back to your question about you know, how are we figuring all this out. Turns out that there are proteins, and these um, uracil DNA glycosylases, there's also a OXO-G glycosylase, which literally scans through the DNA and checks to see if something is wrong. And that completely blows me away, that you have proteins that do this. And the way that they do it, because you can't actually check if everything is base here in the middle, like it normally would be, you actually have to flip those bases out to check and say, hey, is this right, is this wrong? 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 Is this right, is it wrong? Uh, and this is the way it works. You know, these, this is in fact a, a crystal structure of looking at one of these, and this is a particular a DNA glycosylase here, bound to the DNA, the protein is now gone here, but this is what the structure of that DNA looks like with this modified base on it. Really pretty amazing. Uh, and it turns out that there are these specific DNA glycosylases, we already talked about uracil, but it turns out there's one for xanthine, there's one for hyposanthine, because this is what happens when you have deamination. So all of these deamination products have a specific DNA glycosylase that will come in and take these out, and it's scanning the DNA all the time. Again, to me it's kind of mind-blowing that this scanning is actually taking place all the time. Uh, so another way of looking at that, this is in fact not the same, that other one was the structure for uracil DNA glycosylase. This one is for adoxo-G. Um, this is the protein in gray. Here's that DNA. There's that modified nucleotide, which is gonna get chopped off. So again, and this is you know, it's scanning all the way through here. This is uh, <clears throat> another just way of looking at the same thing that we talked about before. This is base excision repair. Our uracil now flopped out. You know it's wrong. You've had deamination of cytosine here. The glycosylase clears of this glycosidic bond, again, between the base and the sugar. You end up with an AP site here. This AP endonuclease will cut on this side. Then your phosphodiesterase gets rid of this one nucleotide, and now you've got a 3'OH that can be extended and ligated back onto here. So that's basically, yeah. Do you know what speed they're speeding at and where they take longer in heterochromatin? So, so the question is, do we know how fast these guys are scanning and would it take longer in heterochromatin? Um, the answer is, I don't know, but I would guess yes. 
Okay, so the, the question is, are all these guys together for basic decision repair, all these different proteins? So you have all the glycosylases and then the AP endonuclease, et cetera. Again, good question, I don't know. Um, but as far as I know, it seems like the glycosylases themselves are pretty separate. They're sort of scanning. But when they find something which is wrong, then there's a signal for the rest of those things to associate there. Uh, so that seems to be what's going on there. We do know, this is a great lead-in to nucleotide excision repair, thank you, um, <laughs> that this is what's happening with the nucleotide excision repair processes, is you have a detection complex, which in the case of E. coli is called UVRAB. Why UVR? What causes thymidine dimers or pyrimidine dimers? Ultraviolet radiation. So if you have a mutant in any of these proteins, they're hypersensitive to UV radiation. So a UVR is a particular protein that's important for resistance to UV radiation. Not surprising, UV radiation leads to thymidine dimers, so these are proteins that are important for dealing with thymidine dimers. Uh, UVR A and B basically scan along the DNA and find structural problems. Because you remember, this is not a particular base issue. This is a structural problem that's happened in the DNA. They get to one of these problems. Then you have dissociation and, much more importantly, association of these endonuclease activities. Endonucleases will bind, make nicks on either side. Then you have the helicase activity and the normal DNA polymerase, which will fill in this particular gap. So nucleotide excision repair, and again, I, like it, I don't know about the base excision repair, but certainly, again, for nucleotide excision repair, that's what's happening. You have these processes which are attached and moving along there. Getting back to your question about heterochromatin is I don't know about the heterochromatin, but what I do know about is an actively transcribed DNA. Then you do actually have repair that's happening with higher frequency. And the reason for that just seems to be, okay, when you've got your transcription, which is happening, if you've got problems in the DNA, then you're not going to be able to make the RNA, which is going to make the protein, or the RNA if it's a functional RNA. So it makes sense to repair the problems that you have in actively transcribed regions faster than you would those that are not in actively transcribed regions. How do you do that? Well, the way you do that is you put your repair machinery together with your RNA polymerase. And the RNA polymerase is bringing the repair machinery along with it. And so if it gets to a place where there's a problem, say a thymidine dimer, then that repair machinery is right there. It's being brought along for the ride. And it turns out that's how people found a lot of these xeroderma pigmentosum proteins. They were associated with the RNA polymerase because these thymidine dimers or the pyrimidine dimers which were there. Um, it's also true in bacteria. You have the RNA polymerase that's associated with the UVR proteins. And so as soon as you come to a problem, as shown here, our RNA polymerase gets to this problem. Nucleotide excision repair happens much more frequently in actively transcribed regions. And you have DNA um, repair which takes place. So, talk really briefly about double-stranded break repair. I'll talk about the first version, and then the second version we'll need a lot more time for, and we'll do that on Monday. So, um, everything we talked about so far is dependent on the redundancy of DNA, right? So, you chop off one strand, you fix it based on the information that's on the other side. Well, that's great, except if you have problems on both strands. This happens clearly with ionizing radiation. And again, radiation therapy. Turns out some chemotherapy drugs um, do this as well. So you have quite a lot of double-stranded breaks that happen there. You also have double-stranded breaks that happen during replication as well. And we'll look at those in a little bit more detail. There are kind of two different ways to deal with this. There's the fast and dirty way, which is called non-homologous end joining, which is basically exactly like what it says. You've got two strands that are broken. You put two strands back together. But they may or may not be the right ones. So hopefully they are right, but sometimes they aren't. Uh, and this is actually probably why radiation therapy, these kinds of things work, because often there are problems that happen there. 
Um, homologous recombination, however, is taking advantage of the fact that in at least all of us, we've not just got these two strands, but we also have mobs coming. Always mobs. Got a count of mobs in that country. So the idea is you've got two copies of your chromosome. They have to be identical to each other, but they can be really similar. And so you can use that homologous chromosome to get the repair. And it turns out in things like E. coli, very often you're undergoing replication as well. So you end up with two copies of what you started with there as well. So it's two double-stranded copies now. And so homologous recombination we'll talk about in a lot more detail. Um, turns out that if you think about double-stranded breaks, we already talked about a particular double-stranded break right at the beginning of class. Telomeres are double-stranded breaks. We want to be very careful that telomeres don't get hooked up to other telomeres or hooked up to other pieces of broken DNA. So that's a problem. Um, Double-stranded breaks, again, um, can lead to cancer, but also can be really good for getting rid of cells. So this is basically just what I talked about. Non-homologous end joining, quick and dirty, pop them apart, put them back together. Or if you've got a sister chromatid, you can use that information on one of these copies to fill in the other one. That's a much more complicated process that we'll talk about on Monday. The easy one, double-stranded break in DNA. You actually chew in the ends a little bit here. So it turns out it's not just banging stuff together wherever, wherever you've got a double-stranded break, but you chew in at the ends as well. And that chewing in at the ends also can cause mutations to take place. Fortunately, most of our genome is junk DNA, i.e. at least not protein coding. And so that non-homologous end joining seems to work reasonably well. Uh, turns out that this process is almost identical to what happens in antibody diversity. Is that cutting, changing the ends, putting them back together. And so that happens um, quite a bit. Again, the actual details here are really not that critical. So, uh, stop here. I'm going to put scantrons at the very back of the room if you want to pick them up. They're organized alphabetically. If you want to come take a look at this structure, there's one really big problem that I've already noticed with it, um, but I'm sure there's some other ones as well.